Hi, my name is Leslie Soph. I'm the Advanced ADHD Nurse Practitioner for the Highlands. So ADHD is an abbreviation for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, which is also sometimes known as ADD Attention Deficit Disorder. It's a common disorder that impacts on focus, impulse control and emotional responses. It's often diagnosed in childhood, but ADHD can also be diagnosed in adolescence and in the adulthood as well. There are three subtypes in ADHD. ADHD is the umbrella term and within that we've got three different types. The first is hyperactive impulsive subtype, where predominantly the features are hyperactive and impulsive behaviours. The second subtype is inattentive and in that case the predominant features are the inattentiveness and problems with concentration and focus. The most common type of ADHD is ADHD combined and that encompasses all three of the areas of ADHD, which is the inattention, the impulsivity and the hyperactivity. So just to give a little bit of history about ADHD, ADHD has been around since humans have been around, so it's always been part of us. It's been it's something that's a neurodevelopmental condition, so it's something that we are born with and changes as we grow. The first documented case of ADHD was 1865 when a German physician called Dr Hoffman wrote a book and he basically wrote this book for his son for a Christmas present and he described a child within this book called Fidgety Phil. So Fidgety Phil is talking about probably about an eight-year-old boy who has lots of features of ADHD. In 1902, a British doctor called Dr George Still came along and he looked at ADHD in a slightly different way. He noted that this wasn't just the odd case of a child with these characteristics, that it was a medical condition and therefore it needed treated as a medical condition. So it wasn't until 1937 that medication was first considered as a possible treatment for ADHD or symptoms of ADHD. And it was a gentleman called Charles Bradley who noted that stimulant medications methylphenidate in particular could be useful to reduce some of the disruptive behaviours found with ADHD but also improve concentration and attention. In the 1970s stimulant medications had been researched more and then became the treatment of choice. There, one of the really important things to note when we're thinking about ADHD and that's been a myth is that there's actually damage to the brain in a young person with ADHD. That's not in fact true. So structurally, the brain looks exactly the same as it would in a child who doesn't have ADHD, is, who is neuro neurotypical. So as I touched on when we looked at the different subtypes of ADHD, there are three symptom groups. Now, if you have an attentive subtype, the majority of your symptoms come from that group. For hyperactive impulsive, would come from the other two columns or in, on this slide and if you have ADHD combined you will have symptoms from all of these groups. So looking at the inattention, obviously the first one is the failure to attend for long periods of time. So that's the lack of focus, the inability to keep the concentration levels up. They'll fail at times to finish tasks just because of that attention span. They'll struggle to organise themselves and their things and we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. Sometimes young people will avoid sustained effort because they know it's going to be really hard. So because they're, they'll have a bit of a fear of failure, they might opt out of something rather than trying and not managing to finish. They can lose things and are particularly forgetful and are really distractible. Again, I'll go into these in a little bit more detail as we go through the presentation. The hyperactive behaviours are the fidgetiness, the real motor restlessness that you find and that's characterised by ADHD, the need for the young person to move. They, that might lead them to get up and down out of their seat in class, particularly in primary school age children. They can run and climb excessively in comparison to their peers. They might struggle to play and work quietly. They usually have a bit of a problem with volume control. So when they're carrying out a task or playing a game, they make a noise as they do so. Sometimes they'll be accused of shouting when actually they don't think that they're shouting, they think they're speaking in a normal tone. They'll, they're always on the go. They're never sitting quietly. They're always on the move and they talk excessively. Now, the excessive talking can also be 
and impulsive behaviour. So if they have something they feel they need to say, want to say, they can't really hold that. They need to say it then and there and it comes out. Now it might come out at the most inappropriate times, um, but they really will struggle to hold that in. So it could lead them to blurting out answers, which again is a difficult thing when, it, when you're in a classroom environment. They might struggle to wait turns, which means that board games, group activities are particularly difficult. They can interrupt others, which doesn't always go down well with teaching staff, and they might intrude on others. So they can be a little less aware maybe than most of their peers about personal space. So they can get really quite close to you without feeling uncomfortable and they don't realise that you might be uncomfortable with that. So at times they can be a bit overwhelming. So in order to make a diagnosis of ADHD, there are certain criteria that we need to meet. Um, the duration, so the symptoms must have been present for at least six months. Now, the symptoms will have always been present in a young person, but the reason there's a cut off is that we can make sure that it's not been a change or something that's happened that has caused these symptoms to occur. So we've got a kind of minimum time that they need to have been present for. The symptoms need to be present before school age or at least age of six or seven. And again, the symptoms are likely to have been noted by the parents since they were um, born, but the symptoms need to be clear before they reach school age. ADHD is a pervasive condition, which means it has to be present across that child, young person, adult's entire kind of daily life. So they, it, they have to show symptoms at home, in school or at work. Um, and we need to make sure that it's at least present in two settings to fulfil the criteria. If a young person only had difficulties in school with inattention and maybe some behavioural problems, but the parents hadn't ever noticed any issues or difficulties, then we would think that's probably not ADHD and vice versa. If there was lots of problems at home, but school found that they focused, attended well, had no problems to behave within the classroom environment, then again, we would be thinking that wasn't likely to be ADHD. Symptoms must have led to a social impairment, so or a significant impairment, whether that's socially, academically, or occupationally in work life. And again, that's just to make sure that we're giving a diagnosis for a good reason. There's, they've got to be, it's got to be impacting them in their daily life in order to meet the criteria. The symptoms need to be excessive. If you were to compare a child with, a, with possible ADHD to a child that you thought definitely didn't have ADHD, who was approximately the same age and with the same IQ, obviously we're not going around testing everybody's IQ, but just to get, give a idea of where they were at in comparison to their peers, their friends, their symptoms should be excessive. Sometimes when we're doing an assessment, we go out to do a school observation and that'll give us a really good opportunity to compare that child to their classmates. The symptoms also need to be looked at against other possible difficulties. So there's lots of things that look like ADHD and we need to make sure that we rule those things out. So for example, autism and ADHD have lots of crossover and can be quite similar. Attachment disorders look, can look like ADHD, trauma can look like ADHD, and even things like problems with vision, vision or problems with hearing can lead to behavioural difficulties, which could be a bit like ADHD. Fetal alcohol syndrome is another difficulty disorder that looks a bit like ADHD. Now, there's a bit of a difference when it comes to boys and girls with ADHD. So they present usually a little bit differently. This slide just really shows the kind of general population in boys and girls. Boys are much more likely to have combined ADHD and have more of the hyperactive and impulsive behaviours alongside their inattention. There's a significant proportion of girls that just have inattentive ADHD. And it's important to highlight that because they can be the girls and boys at times, but majority, majority of the time girls who go under the radar. They don't really cause disruption in the class or problems in the classroom environment, but they are really inattentive. So they might be the ones that are seen as daydreamers, not really kind of focusing, staring out the window, but because they're not causing disruption, they can be missed. So it's important to make sure that we're looking for those cases as well. So there should be an overall prevalence of three to five percent of school-age children that would meet the diagnostic criteria for ADHD. 
So it's quite a significant number. In Highland, I think the last time the statistics were looked at, we were sitting at a diagnostic rate of 0.5%, so well below what we should be seeing. And there may be various reasons for that. I think possibly geography comes into it. Um, in the Highlands, we cover a geographic area the size of Belgium. And there, within that, there's lots of population sparse spread areas where young people might be in smaller schools with less numbers of pupils and have a different sort of support. There might also be that we're missing some of the young people and that might be for, again, for various reasons, possibly that the girls are not being picked up or maybe we're misdiagnosing and we're thinking it's something else. There's four times as many boys diagnosed as girls and that is um, a true statistic. I certainly did an audit in 2015 of all the young people in Highland with a diagnosis of ADHD and there were four times as many boys as girls. I think in reality that's probably slightly skewed and the ratio is more likely to be four to two or four to three but the girls are the ones that we're more often missing so we possibly have more girls that are undiagnosed. For some reason, girls are slightly better at masking their difficulties as well than boys. So we need to be careful not to miss them. ADHD persists into about 80% of young people into adolescence and adulthood. So we used to think that everybody grew out of ADHD up until fairly recently. And we used to take everybody off their medication, support was removed. But actually, research has shown that ADHD doesn't just disappear. It changes as we grow, and I'll explain that further. But 80% of the time, an adult will still meet a diagnostic criteria for ADHD. And that might just be residual symptoms. So they might not have all of the symptoms they had as a younger child, but they will still have some difficulties. So what causes ADHD? Frustratingly, we don't really know. It's the one thing that frustrates me the most, I think. Um, the exact cause is unknown, but what we do know, because we've looked at genetic studies, is that it's highly heritable. So you've got a high chance of developing ADHD or having ADHD if you've got a strong family history of ADHD. So there's about a 75% heritability, which is very high. And um, we've found that out by looking at family studies, twin studies, but also at adoption studies. So we're looking at it from both angles. What we think is that you are going to have a genetic predisposition to develop an ADHD, but that you need various environmental factors or triggers to increase the chances more or increase the likelihood. One of the most researched things and the one that we have got evidence for at the moment is that prematurity is going to increase your risk of having ADHD. There's lots of other things that could possibly increase the risk, whether it's um, stress during pregnancy, a difficult labour and delivery, um, smoking, alcohol use in pregnancy, all of these things could possibly increase the risk. But the only one that we can definitively say will increase your chances of having ADHD is prematurity. And obviously you've got to have your genetic predisposition. So ADHD is neurobiological in nature. It's a chemical imbalance. So as I said earlier, it's not structurally the brain looks how it should and everything's there that should be there and it all works but the chemicals are not available in the right amounts so the frontal lobe and in this slide there's a the brain split into colored areas the frontal lobe in this slide is nice and blue in reality it's a lovely shade of gray but our frontal lobe is our kind of computer it controls all our day-to-day -day tasks and it's the main area that's affected by adhd so the way i like to think about it and explain to my patients and children that I work with is that the chemicals are like the postmen. If you don't have the postmen available, you can't deliver the messages to the other part of the brain. So although everything's there and it works, without the chemicals, the messages aren't going where they need to go. Um, we've, the reason we know that and we can see that is that you can actually see it really clearly on neuroimaging. So we've looked at MRI scans, PET scans, and you can see the frontal lobe doesn't have the levels of activity that a neurotypical child would have. And I've got a nice picture of this. Um, now in this slide, the picture, the photo on the left hand side is a young person. I think both of these children are about eight years old. The picture on the left is a child without ADHD, neurotypical, and there's lots of areas of red in this MRI scan. Now the areas of red are your areas of activity 
and the area on the the child on the right who has ADHD, there's much more areas of blue and green and less of the red areas, which is the high activity. So it really is quite significant and ideally we would scan everybody and we could see clearly whether their ADHD was present or not, but obviously that's not feasible financially. So going back to the developmental course, I said that ADHD changes as you grow and it therefore needs management to change as you grow. Um, an infant or a toddler with ADHD between one and three years, it's very difficult at that stage to work out is that ADHD or is that just a really active toddler. Um, but there already might be a bit of a variation in their temperament. They might have extremes of emotion. They might get overly excited, really upset, um, but just a little bit different to their peers. They might already play in a slightly different way or interact with other children or adults in a slightly different way. But as I say, it's extremely difficult at that point to tease out, is it ADHD or have they not had the social experiences? Have they, are they just a really active, boisterous child? Once a child gets into a preschool or nursery, then you really start to notice the reduced play intensity, the need to move around. They can't really play with one toy for a long period of time. They'll flit from toy to toy, from activity to activity, and really struggle to sit and focus and maybe listen. Um, what that doesn't mean is it doesn't mean that they can't become obsessed with something. So it's sometimes a bit of a myth that people say, oh, but they can play their computer games for hours or they can play with their train set for hours. And actually that's hyper-focus, which a person with ADHD can also do if it's something that they absolutely love or become obsessed with. But for the majority of the time, their attention span is really short and they flit from toy to toy. You'll really start to see the motor restlessness, the need to move around, and even just the fact that an inability to sit on a chair, they kind of are all around the chair, hanging off the side of the chair. Um, they'll be up and down um, and just moving constantly. By the time they get into preschool, you might start to see that there is additional difficulties there. And it's important for us to be aware that some other problems might occur alongside ADHD or due to ADHD. Um, you might notice that they're starting to follow, fall behind their peers and that developmentally they're not quite where they need to be. Now that doesn't mean they can't catch up, but if the supports are put in place to help them to do that, but you might notice that they're not quite where their peers are. Their behaviour can become oppositional and defiant already at quite a young age and that's usually driven by anxiety. A young person with ADHD, they've got such a lot of things to try and manage, control, worry about and their brains are working really, really hard. And because they get anxious and feel out of control, one of the ways that they try to manage that is through behaviour. And that's when you can start to see some of the difficult behaviour happening. And that's why it's important for us as professionals and school staff to help support the child early on and obviously the most important people as the parents or carers. You might again start to see that socially they're struggling a little bit more than you would have hoped um, and they might just need that to be kept a wee eye on. Once they are in primary school, so kind of age five usually in Scotland, up to about 12 years old, you really start to notice the distractibility. There's really high levels of distractibility. So anything happening around about them, they will be distracted by. Again, the motor restlessness is a real issue at that age, but we're already at that point asking them to sit for an entire day in a classroom. You know, so it's just a real big task for a person with ADHD who really needs to move around. Um, you might notice that their behavior or some of their communication is impulsive, it could lead to disruptive behaviour within a classroom environment, especially if they start to struggle. So the associated problems or risks, possible implications at this stage is that you might notice that they have an additional learning difficulty. So there might be a sp specific learning disorder such as dyslexia, dyscalculia, that you might look for or you might become apparent at that point. It's very, very common for a young person with ADHD to have an additional problem. So most neurodevelopmental conditions don't come alone. They usually come hand in hand with other difficulties as well. And these other difficulties might need slightly different management or treatment.
Another thing to look for at this stage is that behaviour becoming more challenging. So if you've had a younger child with oppositional behaviour, you might have an aggressive child developing at this point. One of the other symptoms of ADHD is a low frustration tolerance. So I'm going to describe that a little bit more, but that can lead to aggression. And if they feel anxious or out of control, they might lash out or it might just come over as aggressive behaviour. They might be starting to have or develop low self-esteem or lack of confidence. They are always getting told to sit still, be quiet, listen, pay attention. All things that are really, really difficult for them and that chips away at their self-esteem. So it's important for us as parents, carers, professionals, everybody working with this child to make sure that we're bolstering their islands of strength, their things that they're good at, and making sure that they have belief in themselves. And we're trying to balance out anything that they're struggling with with positives. In some cases, it could lead to the repetition of years or classes. That's unlikely in Highland. We try not to do that. We try to keep a young person with their peer group, their friends. But if we are going to do it, we try to do it as early as possible. So they might get a repeat year in nursery or in primary one. Um, ADHD could lead to rejection by their friends, their peers, because they are quite overwhelming. They sometimes try too hard and that just can be a bit in their friends' faces and things like that. It, all of these things can lead to stress and strain on the family and lead to family relationships becoming a bit impaired. So it's important for us to support the entire family. And then they hit adolescence and we throw hormones into the mix, which obviously complicates things even more. But an adolescent with ADHD, the picture does change slightly. So they're still going to have difficulty with planning, with organisation skills. And what we ask them to do is go into secondary school, where they now have eight subjects per day with eight different teachers. And we're asking them to make sure they remember all of their subject matter for those subjects on each day and get themselves in a massive environment, which is usually completely different to primary school, from classroom to classroom, from building to building, and manage that within a sensible time frame. So it's a real challenge for a young person with ADHD. The one benefit of them going to secondary school is that they get to move. They've got reason to move, they move between classes. So that actually can really help for them to settle themselves to go back into the next subject. It also means that they don't have to stay with one teacher for an entire day. And if they've struggled with a particular teaching style, then they can, they know that they've only got 40 minutes, 50 minutes, and they can move on. The inattention continues to be an issue at this stage, and we've obviously increased the pressures on that young person um, to focus for longer or to do more independent learning. So the teacher's not guiding them as much as they maybe would have done in a primary school environment. So it's important that they get the adequate support there. There is a reduction, however, in their motor restlessness. So depending on how severe their ADHD had been, if it was the severe end of ADHD, you might only get a mild reduction and you might have still some motor restlessness. But if their ADHD was mild to moderate, you might almost see that disappear. So that is one thing that will change as a young person with ADHD gets to adolescence. The risks or associated problems at this point change that you've now got a six foot t two teenager who's aggressive. That's a bit different to managing an eight year old who is aggressive. So it is really important that we gear families um, and young people up with strategies to help them manage their ADHD. They could get into antisocial or delinquent behaviour. Usually a young person with ADHD is quite easily led. They're not the best at making good decisions about their friendship groups and are so desperate at times to have friends that they'll do anything that their friends tell them to do, which could lead them into some problems. Also, if they've been kind of struggling in school and it's made them skip classes, for example, they'll end up hanging about with the other people that are skipping classes who might not be who you would choose as the ideal friendship group. Alcohol and drug problems is a risk. Now, most teenagers at some point are going to experiment with alcohol or drugs. Um, however, you've already got a teenager who is impulsive, has a lower inhibition level of inhibition, so they tend to kind of say things as they are, are a bit more out there anyway. And then you add alcohol and drugs into the mix, which lowers your inhibitions even further. So obviously that is a concern when we're looking at ADHD. So it's just making sure 
that we educate them and prepare them as much as we can about alcohol and drugs. Emotional problems is probably more, to me in my experience, more of an issue I've seen than the alcohol and drug use in some ways, because I think it's that real negativity that people have about ADHD that leads these young people to have this belief that they're not as good as everybody else, there's something wrong with them, they're bad, they're naughty, and that just really begins to make somebody feel that they're not really worthwhile. So it can lead to things like um, mood problems, depression, anxiety disorders. So it's really important for them to know that having ADHD is not a terrible thing. That again, there is an increased risk of accidents because they are more impulsive. So they're not really thinking through the consequences of their actions. They've done it before they've thought about it. So if they were with their mates and they're all standing on the pier and they're all having a muck about and, oh, let's jump in to the harbour. Now, all of their friends might have looked and had a look and see what they're jumping into. A young person with ADHD has already jumped by then. So they've not really thought about the consequences, they've not thought through or had a, prepared for what could happen. Adults with ADHD. Now, as I said earlier, we used to think everybody grew out of ADHD. Uh, it was just a childhood disorder. It used to be called the um, hyperkinetic reaction of childhood disorder a long, long time ago. So we used to think everybody grew out of it. But we now know that's definitely not the case, that 80% of the time an adult is a young person with ADHD is likely to develop into adulthood with ADHD. Um, that'll be residual symptoms. So the symptoms do change. They're not going to have so much problem with the motor restlessness. However, they might still have significant problems with um, attention span or maintaining focus. So they might not choose jobs like sitting in a boardroom having big long meetings. Um, they probably are likely to still have issues with working memory. And I'll explain a little bit more about working memory shortly. But what a young, an ad, young adult can do is hopefully by that point, if they've had the adequate support, they've got lots of problem solving skills and things in place to help support them in their work life. Obviously, we need to think about what if their ADHD hadn't been very well supported or had gone undiagnosed, what the associated difficulties could be. And that could be other mental health conditions or mental illness because they've really struggled. Um, there's a really good talker called Michelle Beckett, who was an adult diagnosed with ADHD and she suffered or was misdiagnosed as having lots of mental health problems, anxiety disorders, depression, bipolar, and her ADHD had gone undiagnosed. And once it was diagnosed, she felt that she finally understood why all of these things had been so difficult for her. And her mental health improved because of that as well. Obviously, if you've had an adolescent that's got into antisocial or delinquent behaviour, you've then got an adult who's possibly taken part in that behaviour and they don't get away with it. So police are not going to give you a warning or um, a slap on the wrist. You're going to be charged with that. So that can lead to problems. And there is a high proportion of young people in young offenders units and the prison population that have ADHD or an undiagnosed ADHD. So we need to make sure that we are supporting them and that they're not going down these more negative routes. Usually they're not getting in trouble for the big things like murder and rape and burglary. It's usually low level things, but the problem is, is that they repeat it. It's not learning from their kind of mistakes, I suppose. So they're getting into um, little, you know, stealing or fire setting, but they're doing it over and over again. So we need to make sure that they're learning from their mistakes and that we're supporting them in a positive way. It could lead to a lack of achievement, if, especially if they've not been supported adequately in school. So we really want them to re reach their potential academically and professionally. And one of the kind of most current people, I suppose, that's uh, well known is Emma Watson, who was Hermione Granger in Harry Potter. And she has ADHD combined. I'm going to show a few other people who have ADHD that might be known. Um, so Justin Timberlake has inattentive ADHD. Michelle Rodriguez is, was in the Fast and Furious films. I think she was in Lost. She also has ADHD combined. Um, Will I Am, you see Will I Am's ADHD. If you watch, ever watch The Voice, he can't really sit in his chair sensibly. He's usually hanging off the side of his chair. He also says things quite inappropriately or impulsively. You think, why did you say that? So it's quite, he can appear quite random at times, but it works for him. He's so creative. Um, 
Michael Phelps is the American Olympic swimmer who's won, I can't remember exactly, but it's 20 something gold medals. Now he used his ADHD and the energy, the drive and the determination that are qualities of ADHD in order to achieve what he wanted to in his swimming career. So it's about focusing on the positives and what they bring. Jim Carrey, again, you can see ADHD and the roles that suit Jim Carrey, the roles that he's probably chosen for or he picks himself, I'm not sure how it works, but he gets to move around, he gets to be really extrovert, um, pull silly faces, make um, silly voices, and that works really well for him. Jamie Oliver, who's a chef, Again, probably more so in the films you saw of him when he was younger, when he was first on TV screens, he was quite um, extrovert. He was kind of all over the place, the way he would throw his ingredients in, etc. Uh, Billy Connolly, again on stage in his stand-up routines, he uses the whole stage. He moves around, he really kind of acts out what he's, the stories he's telling you. And he jumps from one story to another, but they all come together at the end. Richard Branson's probably the best example of ADHD working well in that he comes up with the most fantastic ideas and that's one of the real benefits of having ADHD is you think out of the box, you can be really creative and he's not scared to say, I want to fly around the world in an air balloon or let's send people to space in a rocket and get them to pay for it. Now I would probably be a bit anxious about saying that to people because they'd think I'd gone or lost the plot so, but for him it works and people back him because he's confident and he knows what he wants when he gets bored with it he sells it and he makes his millions billions so it works really well so that type of role for a person for ADHD entrepreneur is a really good way forward I suppose the biggest thing for me and the biggest thing that I'm working towards at the moment is not looking at ADHD as a negative so when a young person comes and is diagnosed I don't want us to be saying so you've got ADHD and this means you're going to have difficulties with all of these things. I want to say, so the really good news is you've got ADHD and that means that you're neurodiverse, you're intelligent, you think out of the box, you're creative, you um, are more willing to explore, you don't, you're not so cautious. You know, these are really, really big strengths. We wouldn't have creators, discoverers, inventors, if we didn't have young people with ADHD and things like autism, other neurodevelopmental conditions. So we need everybody to be different. We don't want to all be the same. Thomas Edison, one of their biggest inventors, is most likely to have had ADHD. So we need young people with ADHD. I'm just going to give a little bit more detail about some of the parts of the frontal lobe that's controlled um, or is our control centre, should I say, and it's the one where the chemicals are imbalanced. And we call these activities of daily living our executive functions. So the first of the functions that our frontal lobe takes care of is organising themselves, prioritising and activating. So if you have, AD, if you have ADHD, you've got more difficulty organising your tasks and your things. Now, if you've got ADHD and you're in primary school or a nursery, your parents can do that for you to an extent and obviously hopefully help you um, do that but once you get into secondary school you've got to do a lot more of that yourself and that can be a big challenge. A young person with ADHD might have trouble getting started on work so people think that they procrastinate but they don't really procrastinate they just sometimes don't know how to start and it might be as simple as the teacher coming along and saying have you got a pencil or do you, you just need to turn to page 39 and that they're like oh okay and on they go but sometimes they're just not sure what it is they need to do to start. They'll misunderstand directions. Now, we talked about their focus. So if somebody gives a big long-winded instruction or explanation, they're not going to be able to hear all of that or listen to all of that. So they might only hear the last bit, a bit in the middle that interested them most, and therefore they might get things mixed up. So it's important to break things down, to make them bite size and make them clear, not vague, um, so they know exactly what we're asking them to do. For example, if you turned it into a question and said, do you want to do your homework? Well, you're given a choice, you're not actually given a direction. So if they turn around and say no, well, why didn't you just say it's time to do your homework? So it's just about being careful how we break things down, make them clear to a young person with ADHD. So the second executive function that their frontal lobe controls is our focus, our ability to shift focus and to sustain attention. So a person with ADHD is more likely to lose focus. 
especially if it's a long-winded plan, um, a long-winded project, they're not going to manage that particularly well. They might forget what they've read and need to reread it. Now, we all do that sometimes, especially if we're tired, under pressure, stressed, we'll think, oh, what was that I just read? Imagine having to do that the majority of the time. So it's hard work. They have to make sure that they're repeating things, that things are clicking and going in. So they might need to just have things to back up what they've already learned. So if a teacher teaches them something, tells them something, it's really good for them to have a visual of that as well to back that up. Now, they're easily distracted. Now, they're not just distracted by external things. So they're distracted by the clock ticking, somebody walking past, voices in the corridor, and all of that is equally overwhelming as each other. They can't really filter it out. They're also distracted by internal things. So if they're worried, if somebody said something that upset them before they walked into the class, that is all there as well, and they're unable to filter that out. So again, imagine just having all of those things, all of those noises running through your mind, and you can't block any of those things out. Our frontal lobe also regulates our alertness and our effort and our processing speed. So with ADHD, one of the symptoms usually is that sleep is quite poor. They've usually got a, a less of a need for a long period of sleep, but it's really important for them to still get adequate sleep. So having really good sleep routine, sleep hygiene is very, very important. But can you imagine trying to switch that busy brain off? That's why it can be really difficult for them and that's why we have to help them get a good routine in so that their brains can start to settle down, calm down and unwind. And if you're not getting enough sleep, as everybody probably knows, you can't focus as well. You get more grumpy, you're less tolerant of other people, your memory is worse. All things that are already affected by ADHD, so that could be exacerbated or made worse by lack of sleep. And if you don't sleep well, then you're not alert and ready to go the next day. Now our processing speed is the speed at which we process instructions. Um, when we've looked at young people in cognitive assessments and we've looked at processing speed, it's usually below average. Now it can be supported, it can be improved, but it means that they take longer to process an instruction in a direction. So they need a longer period of time to respond to that um, instruction. Or you might need to make sure that they've understood it, you might need to repeat it. So it's just giving them time. It does mean, all of this means that they might quickly lose interest in tasks, especially long projects, and they won't sustain the effort because they really struggle to do that. And they might have difficulty completing tasks on time because it takes them that bit longer. They're also not usually very good at time management, so helping them to do that can be really um, beneficial. Writing is usually more tricky than some of the maths type subjects or science, so literacy tends to be more tricky for a young person with ADHD but not always. So another thing that will be difficult is managing their frustration and managing their emotions. So they've got a low frustration tolerance. I always think of a young person with ADHD like a pan of simmering water. They're always simmering. It only takes a tiny little bit of heat for them to bubble over and for there to be some kind of reaction. The rest of us, it's usually cold and it takes a number of things for, before we get to that point. So what might seem to us as an overreaction to a certain event or situation doesn't feel like that to them. They're already at that point before that thing's happened. So it might seem like an overreaction, but we've got to validate their feelings. They'll struggle to put things to the back of their head. If somebody's upset them, they probably will hold that against them forevermore. So it's quite hard for them to move on from things. And because for everybody, our emotions impact on our thoughts, our thoughts on our behaviour, but with ADHD, it happens like that. So again, they can go from naught to 60 in three seconds. Work and memory is hugely affected by ADHD. Now, not our long-term memory. Our long-term memory is a different part of the brain. It's further back. And actually, they can tell you what happened seven years ago at so-and-so's birthday party in minute detail. And that can be quite confusing because then you ask them to go and fetch their um, shoes and they've gone off through, you go looking for them 20 minutes later and they're sitting in their bedroom playing with something. They've got no recollection that you spoke to them. Never mind ask them to fetch your shoes, their shoes. And that's their working memory. You need your working memory to carry out all of the tasks you've been asked to do. Um, it's almost probably affected in a young person with ADHD like to, or to the level of somebody with mild dementia. Now it's not going to get progressively worse and we can put lots of strategies in to support it, but it is a big impact. 
So it means that they'll forget intended tasks or comments, instructions, but they also have difficulty recalling learned material. Now the learned material is stored back in the other part of their brain, but they need their frontal lobe to recall it. So it needs to be working for them to pull that out when they need to. So if we can give them prompts, visual aids, things to back it up, it can help them to do that. And they lose everything, like ridiculous things. I've had young people that have lost three school jumpers in a week. They've come home with somebody else's trainers. They've lost their iPad. They've got no recollection of where they saw it last or when they last had it. So our work in memory is important. It's the search engine for their brain. A young person with ADHD can be too fast on tasks, so they need to monitor themselves and they're not as able to do that. So they can rush through things, make careless mistakes, and they'll interrupt or act impulsively, which we've talked about. And they're just not as good at monitoring that. So that's when parents, teachers can provide the scaffolding for the child. So just to touch on a couple of things before I finish. So ADHD obviously can impact on school performance. It could lead to poor classroom behavior possibly poor academic achievement, and that's the bit that we want. We want them to achieve their potential. So what can we change or put in place to help them to achieve that? They might need special education requirements, especially if they've got an additional learning difficulty, um, but they might need one-to-one -one or a PSA support for learning support for a specific subject, or they might get extra tutoring. It could lead to school exclusion, whether that's suspension or, or expulsion. We would try everything to avoid that so usually that it doesn't come to that we've got child's plans in place we're trying to get everybody involved to support the child they might need to repeat school years as i touched on earlier and they might not gain their qualifications but there are lots of strategies supports that can be put in place to hopefully prevent these things so just briefly to touch on treatment and management i'm not going to go into detail because this um, would need to be looked at individually but no two children with ADHD are the same. So there's not a one size fits all. We can't say if you do these things and take this medicine, you're not going to have any symptoms of ADHD because they're all different. So effective strategies need to be individualised and we need to look at their strengths, their areas of needs and their learning needs and then put all of that together. So some of the ways that we can help a young person with ADHD is through behavioural therapy or behavioural interventions. And that might just be done at school. It might be the parents coming along to the parenting group to learn strategies to support their children. Um, they might come to me for a more intensive support. There's lots of ways that can happen. There is ADHD medication, but that's not always used. Um, but that can reduce ADHD symptoms, but only when the medication's active in the body. Now, most of the medications we use are stimulant medications which work to cover the school day. So they're about improving academic um, potential and they don't usually cover the evenings or the mornings before school. Classroom accommodations is a big thing. So it might be taking movement breaks, mu building music and movement into the classroom, getting extended time on tests or exams, having a scribe, going to another room, or they might have to um, have a wobble cushion so that they can move in their seat or a fidget toy, lots of things can be put in place to support class environments. So touching on medication, medication should just be one part of a treatment package for a young person with ADHD and isn't necessarily always our first step. It depends on the severity of their ADHD symptoms. So the first time it was looked at, as I said in the beginning, was 1937 by Charles Bradley and he noted that it could have a benefit on the inattention and possibly some of the disruptive behaviour. There's still a bit of debate and research ongoing and places like America and Canada are much further forward in their prescribing practices than we are, but we tend to be cautious. And I like that approach, especially with medication in young people. We don't want to medicate everybody. That's not what we're about. But it can have a positive impact on a number of children and helps them with the focus, the attention, the concentration, but it won't necessarily help them with behavioural problems. So if there's long standing behavioural issues, they will need different approaches to help support those. Um, it might make them slightly less impulsive, but as I say, the real benefit of it is about improving academic performance. Some recent research raised concerns about the long-term effectiveness of medication, and that's because we didn't have long-term research, really. We thought everybody grew out of ADHD. So we didn't have 
40, 50 years of somebody being on an ADHD medication to know how safe that was, how effective it was. But we are starting to gather that research now and we've got no reason to think that there is any problems with having it long term. We have lots of young people that now decide, I want to stay on my medication because I know it helps me. And if they're going into college and apprenticeship, I just if they're going into working life, they know it'll benefit for them. So they will choose to stay on that medication. Now, if you want more information about medication, I would suggest that you discuss it with your paediatrician if you have one. If you want to discuss it and you don't, you're not known to paediatrics and your child has a diagnosis, then you would ask your GP to make a re-referral to community paediatrics so that that could be discussed more. So thank you very much for listening for all that time. Um, I hope everybody's found it useful just to signpost you to some other um, useful things. If you want to have a look at the ADHD Foundation, their website's fantastic. It's got the most up-to-date uh, materials about ADHD, the most up-to-date research. You can, I think they've got a website, an Instagram and a Facebook page. There's also ADHD and You, which is a website which is quite useful. Um, back to the ADHD Foundation, they also run yearly conferences for professionals, but also for parents, which are brilliant. Um, Chip Plus is available for advice and support. They've got books, they've got leaflets, um, and they might just be able to point you in the direction of somebody who could support you. Uh, your community paediatrician, if you have one, is obviously a good point of contact. And you, I can be contacted through the Department of Community Paediatrics. However, I only work part-time and there is only one of me, so it might take a bit of time for me to get back to you. Um, but hopefully all of those things are in place for you to get help. And school, obviously, your named person at school, your child's named person at school is always a good point of contact. So thank you very much for your time.